Folks, thanks very much for coming along to today's lunch and thanks Sam for his kind words. Uh, I want to introduce myself again and I feel very lucky to be sitting next to three gentlemen who have so much influence over different sports but different parts of the sport we most of us love. And I want to start by asking them something terribly unserious. Andrew, if you had dropped back into an AFL dressing room today with your body of sort of 20 odd years ago, but for current conditions, what would you notice? What were the biggest difference that players experience playing senior football now that compared to when you were playing? Oh, once upon a time when I played, the words sports science weren't fashionable back then. <laughs> um, and sort of rehab and recovery and high performance was sort of Sunday morning with beer and chicken. Um, so that would be the most significant difference, I would imagine. Michael, if you were put back into your Ramic when you said, well, I was colours and given the body you had 20 years ago and sent to play for your own team, you know, you know what would you notice? What's the on-field and, and pre-field changes? I think um, when I played in Randwick, <clears throat> one of the big things I noticed to compared to today is uh, underneath the stand at Kujiova, we had a smoker's dressing room and a non-smoker's dressing room. So, you know, that is a, so we've, we've got a lot to learn and um, the other major sports have... Uh, you know, have done a far better job in managing that than we have and, and we're just starting to pursue that path. Andrew, I looked for a few minutes on the web, on various websites. The AFL gets money from the Australian Sports Commission, the Department of Education, Employment and Workplace Relations, Department of Families, Housing and Community Services, Department of Indigenous, Indigenous Affairs and John Brumby, one of his statements was he boasted that over the course of his time in Premier he'd given $200 million to the AFL. What is the trick? Can you t tell Michael that trick? How do we, how do we swing that? Well, you were going well until John Brumby, you didn't give us any money. Uh, that's not true, but... He claimed it. Uh, no, he gave it, um, he gave it to a stadium. He didn't give it to us, but uh, we did get $535 million out of the South Australian government for Adelaide Oval, so that was a good thing. Um, you writing this down, Michael? <laughs> no, look, I, I think... Um, I mean, our approach has always been to work with whoever's in, in government, uh, whether that's state level, federal level. We also work very closely with with our local government and we do so on the basis of never apologising for government funding, taxpayers' money, because our view is that sport, your sport, our sport, uh, even rugby league, soccer, make a significant contribution to the community. And right. I want to talk about the entertainment value of the sports that you chaps run in various capacities. Michael, the, we may talk about blood infusions later on, but the Waratahs fans might need blood infusions. They're very anemic, aren't they? The, the support at the Waratahs games is light on, and just lacking in, I don't know, there seems to be less passion at that ground than there might be. Is that something that you guys are aware of as coach and players? Well, obviously, it's my first season, and I heard uh, a lot before I came about this whole syndrome, per se. And I, I'm a big believer that we, have, we are the keys to, to turning that on. You know, I think... Um, I'm not going to ask people to come and juggle and stand on their heads and, you know, throw their shirts around and hoot. We've got to give them, make them passionate about the way we're playing the game and what we're, not just how we're playing the game, how we're representing the team. And the previous Prime Minister said that she was more likely to become full forward for the Bulldogs than she would become Prime Minister and all of a sudden that changed. Did you get any sense, did you get any sense or tip or any inside feel from senior levels of government that something big was happening in the AFL before that Blackest Day in Australian Sport Conference? Were you as ambushed as everybody else? Uh, well, at the conference, yes, but I mean, we'd had briefings from the Australian Crime Commission, as had the other sports, and, you know, just picking up on Michael's point, um, you know, we've never deluded ourselves that uh, organised crime is infiltrating global sport because if you don't believe it, you are delusional. I mean, there are currently 300 matches of European soccer that are being investigated for match fixing. So this is an appalling and, and disturbing trend and where you've got professional sports, all sports, you're going to see uh, organised crime figures try to infiltrate and sometimes it might not be match fixing. Perhaps it can be as simple as information sharing. I want to know who's playing on who, I want to know who's out of the team. I want to know um, what the coach is thinking about a strategy. This is significant information for people who seek to gain significant financial benefits from it. So with that in mind, we've, for uh, a number of years, particularly since 2008, when we set up arrangements with betting agencies, we did that on the, on the premise that in order to protect our code, 
we needed to have agreements so we could have information sharing. And the only way you can do that is if you sign up with betting agencies. And that's how we've caught players or people at clubs actually betting on our games. And that's where it started. So, you know, we've invested millions of dollars in our integrity unit. And it's about information gathering. It's about surveillance. It's about protecting the integrity of the code. It takes into account illicit drugs, performance enhancing drugs, um, match fixing, betting and the like. So we weren't, we weren't, um, you know, we, we certainly weren't unaware of these things, but until we were briefed by the Australian Crime Commission, we certainly were not aware of some things. And I think there would have been every CEO who had that briefing walked away uh, in a bit of shock about certain things they heard. That then translated into the famous press conference and uh, it was only described the darkest day in sport by Richard Ings, who used to work at Asada, who, who hates an interview and hates a camera. Um, but I think there are some positives that have come out of it, because certainly since that particular day, we've conducted an investigation, we've enhanced our drug code, we've gone above and beyond WADA to mitigate the risk to protect our code, we've in implemented various things around you know, banning the use of IVs, restricting the use of injections, you know, having registers to register people in their backgrounds. Uh, we've, got a, you know, we've got a whistleblower service. We've, we've actually taken significant steps to improve the governance at all of our clubs. And this has been a positive. And along the way, you have some casualties. But if you want to protect your code, particularly from people who seek to benefit from it financially, you need to do that and you need to mitigate the risk. So we're not complaining about what happened. Uh, it is what it is, and what we do know is we are, an infinite, we are in an infinitely better shape today because of the, all the measures we've put in place since we uh, you know, had this report. There's been people whose job it is to report on AFL put acres of newsprint and hours of electronic media on the Essendon thing. I won't begin to try and come over the top of those guys as they do it for a living. But can I just get you to comment on how you negotiate the fact that you're working in three different jurisdictions? You're trying to run a commission which is effectively a legal and judiciary body. You've got people who want to go outside that to the courts of Victoria or the Commonwealth. And then you've got WADA and ASADA who have different legal processes and rules all happening concurrently. How the bloody hell do you negotiate those three different imperatives and different rules of evidence, different rules of discovery? Is there an answer to that? Is that, is that possible? Well, certainly not wishing to use Essendon and I'll put that to the side because I don't want to comment on that. Look, in our code, you know, we've been blessed since 1985 to have an independent commission. So we've got a purely independent board. And in 1985, the 12 Victorian clubs who were broke at that time, and I say they were broke because they were broke, they took the most significant decision that we've ever had in the history of our game. They actually sat down and voted themselves out of office. And if you think about that, you know, these are the shareholders. They're sitting there saying, I'm going to vote myself out of office and I'm going to vest my faith in the complete running of this game to a group of people who will be totally independent. And the other thing is we actually don't even know who they're going to be. So what they did was they implemented that decision. It was a very courageous decision, an historic decision. And then a group of commissioners came in and we were lucky to have uh, people like Peter Scanlon and Graeme Samuel and Dick Seddon and I could go on and on, uh, Colin Carter and others, who have served the game incredibly well in an honorary capacity. And from 1985, they introduced a, a salary cap a draft, uh, they introduced ground rationalisation, equalisation, revenue sharing, only because they were totally independent. And under that structure, every club signed up to be bound by the rules and regulations of our competition to be governed by an independent board. So when people are peddling around this, these issues about how can this commission hear this and uh, uh, how is it that it goes outside the courts, well, we have got an interest in the game. We don't ever apologise for having an interest in the game because our obligation is to the 18 clubs. So we do take an interest in the game. That's our obligation to protect the integrity of the game. That's why our clubs sign up to the rules and regulations of the game. And, you know, yesterday the club presidents met and they endorsed, again, the primacy of the running of the game back into the AFL Commission. And that strikes the whole independence of the game, that we have a group of people who have not beholden to any vested interests, any club backgrounds, they vote on every decision that goes at our place as a completely independent board. Is the preparedness of people to stay in your system now the main game, now the main dispute that you're facing right now? I don't understand the question. Is, 
if people start saying, OK, this is commission, but I don't like the answers for the commission, I'm going somewhere else. I'll go to a higher court, I'll go to the high court. That's the thing that you... Is that now the main thing that you want to stop? Has that now become the most important battle for you in the last little, little few days? Oh, I don't know. I mean, people have got... I mean, you know, you know you've got, if, if a club wants to take things to the court and go outside the system, that's entirely their prerogative. Um, but that wasn't the, the premise of the Commission was to stop that, right? You wanted to run everything in-house. Yeah, and it doesn't happen that often. But I, and again, I don't even know if that will occur. Um, but if it does, it does. I mean, the, our clubs will have a view on that. Um, and I, I suspect I'll say something wrong in here because there's probably lots of, you know, there's probably lots of lawyers and barristers in the too room. Way too many. But they're doing a roaring trade in Melbourne at the moment. <laughs> Can I just say something again? I mean, I, the, uh, the thing that... Uh, I'd say that one thing about Australian rules, they went to an independent board in 1985. We went into it in October last year. So we're, we're a smaller game. We're younger at professional games. So we're learning. And we're pretty interested in this. But I will also say that from our point of view, we've got a, we've, we've got a set of standards which we expect in our game. And that if we find that uh, people move outside those standards, we think it's our right to be able to say to them, you've moved outside the standards of that and we can judge them according to our rules. They might win a court battle, but as far as we're concerned about the integrity of our game, we will take them on and say we're out, you're outside our, you just, our game. You put a big smile on Michael Checker's face just by saying No, that. it's just interesting because um, uh, I was involved in a match uh, in, when I was coaching in Europe, which your own coach, Chris Malone, was involved in, where um, uh, we were involved in a Heineken Cup quarter final, and uh, it was, the score was 6-5 at the time, and um, uh, the 5-8, Nick Evans came off, Chris came on, and then he got injured subsequently. So the coach at the time there used blood capsule to bring Evan, uh, Nick Evans back on to try and kick a drop goal. So he actually got the shot at drop goal. He missed, thankfully. Chris wouldn't now, have missed. No, Chris wouldn't have missed. There's no doubt about that. But um, if he kicked it, would we as a club have had the right... It was proven that they, they cheated, basically. Would we as the club had the right to actually go outside the commission to change the rules and to get the result changed, you know? And it's a, it's, there's a lot of grey areas that we've never gone to and as sport becomes more public and, and more mediatised and the, the stakes are a little bit higher for everybody, then people go to more extremes, I suppose. I'll just touch on this very obliquely just one more time. Many of you would be a fan of the, of the rock band Oasis and their second album sold 22 million copies. So Noel Gallagher goes into the studio and records these songs that are 15 minutes long. He sees, he's looking around waiting for someone to tell him to stop and nobody would, no one would say no to Noel Gallagher at that time. So the album's sort of rubbish. Is the risk that blokes who come out of superheroes in their sport, in their club, end up running the club, and that nobody will say no to these guys? There's a risk that if, you, if someone goes too quickly from being a senior player and an AFL legend or a rugby legend to being a hands-on coach, that their authority is almost too great, that there's too much reverence towards these guys, Andrew. No one in particular, obviously. Um, look, again, I, and I, I, I can't speak for rugby, I can only speak for our code. On balance, our most successful clubs, as a general principle, are clubs that seem to have, you know, something in common, and that is they've normally got a very strong chairman, a very strong CEO, a very strong captain, um, and they've got... Um, a very strong coach who align and sign up to the same values. And if you get that right, if you get that spine right, that the four are aligned, normally you have success. If you get three out of the four, it's not bad. When someone deviates from that, you have trouble. Um, and if it's a coach who seeks to exert his authority to try and run a club, it doesn't work. If it's the chairman who wants to dominate, at the expense of the others. It doesn't work. So, but normally our most successful clubs have had an alignment to the core principles and the values of that club and they normally win through. You've got two blokes nodding alongside you here who obviously agree from their experience of professional rugby and amateur rugby. Folks, we're short of time. Andrew's got to get on an airplane. I think in the midst of all the stuff that's been happening in the last little while, to have Andrew Demetrio, he's been exceptional and a, and a tribute to our club and a tribute to his interest in what we're doing up here. So please thank Andrew Demetrio thank for you. coming today. Thank you.